Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I wanna to answer some questions that have come up about how the AI worked in Arcanum. Before I start though, I should think it, it's funny, I just got a Google or YouTube analytics email, because I've been doing this for more than 90 days, where it was telling me what videos were popular and what weren't and trying to give me advice of what to do. And I, the advice seems to be skewed towards doing things that get more people to watch ads because it told me these technical ones, well, those attracted less viewers. And according to YouTube, they don't think people want that. Which ones do they want? Why I quit Fallout 2, why I quit Wildstar. They want all the gossipy ones, which I think is funny because the the YouTube algorithm is pushing me to doing negative gossipy videos uh, because it says that's what people consume. Yet when you actually look at the comments, what people are asking for are more of these technical ones. So I'm going to do these. Fewer people watch. So be it. So a lot of the questions around Arcanum's AI came up after I explained how procedural generation and prototypes uh, and things like that worked. You may want to go and look at those videos. Um, I'm going to assume you already know about sectors and maps and things like that. So probably one of the most interesting things about writing Arcanum's AI was when you were out in the world, when you weren't in an instance, like in a dungeon or an instanced building. In theory, everything's there. The entire world is there. But of course, we can't keep that all in memory. Even with prototypes, we couldn't keep all the creatures in memory. So what we did, and I thought this was kind of clever, if you know the sectors are arranged on a grid, what that means is when you're in the center of a sector, by design, that's the only sector you can see. That we deliberately made sectors big enough and the viewport of the game small enough that when you were in the middle of a sector, that sector is the only one that had to be loaded. And then what we did is as you move towards a side or a corner of a sector, it would load up to those three adjoining sectors. Bear in mind that at no point can you ever see more than four sectors at a time in Arcanum. And that would occur when you're standing near a grid point where there's one, two, three, four sectors. That's the only time you can see four. Often you can just see one. That What that meant is we knew we never had to have more than four sectors loaded at once. So that's what we did. As you went towards one corner, we would unload the sectors you were getting far away from and preload the ones you were getting close to. When we loaded them, in addition to all the art and everything, we loaded the creatures and they would get heartbeats. Everything in AI, except for the animation system, which got its own ticks, all the AI was based on heartbeats. And these heartbeats were every two or three seconds. I thought there were two seconds. I looked in the code and it looked like they were three. A heartbeat interval was defined as three seconds. So let's go with three seconds. What that means is when the creature is activated, it gets its first heartbeat and it's labeled first heartbeat because sometimes you want to do something special on that. By the way, if this reminds you of Unity, it's very much what Unity does. We just did this in 1998. I think it's just a standard way of handling this. So when creatures would activate, because they're sector loaded, they would get a first heartbeat. That would tell them things like, you're awake, you're active, you should be doing things. And this is the first time I've told you that. So if there's anything special you need to set up. So like if you're a creature, you, you might want to wield something, you might want to check your inventory, you might want to look around you. Anything you want to do, do that now. You are pretty much guaranteed to be off screen. Because even when you load into an instance, we distributed those first heartbeats before we faded in. When you're approaching a sector, it's guaranteed to be off screen. So you can do things that might look weird, like if you need to teleport to a particular position, or you need to start an animation, or you need to pull out a weapon. You can do that and be assured no one's seeing you do it. Now, what's interesting about heartbeats, I said they were every three seconds. Not really. What we did is based on your distance away, we would lower your heart rate. And we did this over the number of tiles away. And I think the maximum beyond 30 tiles, we stopped lowering it. But what that meant was you only got that higher heart rate when you were 
near the player. And past that, you would start getting a slower heart rate and a slower heart rate and a slower heart rate. And the reason for this is we literally didn't have the CPU cycles to spare giving full heart rates to all the creatures that could potentially be in all that space around you. So we slowed it down. And that was fine. If, if a character was supposed to be walking and they got a slower heart rate, they would jump across where they were supposed to be walking, which was fine because you couldn't see them. If they were trying to decide what to do, they would only make decisions at a slower and slower rate. They would only look around themselves less often. And that's okay because you're not there to see it happen. Now, there were four basic AI states for any creature. It was not fighting, fighting, fleeing, and surrendered. I think fighting and not fighting makes sense. Fleeing is what happens um, when you, most creatures had a flee state, which was what percent health you would drop below and then you'd run away. Some of them that was set to zero, so they would never flee. And then the fleeing was you would flee for a certain number of seconds and then you'd stop. You wouldn't come back to fight, but you'd stop and you'd go into not fighting. Surrender was something different. Surrender was different things to put you in the surrender state. Spells could do it. Um, I believe there was a, um, <coughs> a, uh, something based on your charisma that could do it. But in any case, once you went into surrender mode, you would just stop fighting. You would not start fighting unless A, you were attacked, or B, your health got above a certain amount. And I think it was like 80%. And then you were like, well, I feel healthy again. I don't need to, uh, I don't, I will go from being surrendered to not fighting. And the interesting thing about fighting, this is where all the interesting stuff happens, at least in my opinion, in AI. So when someone's attacked, let's call it attacker and victim. When an attacker attacks a victim, that attack is reported. There are two radiuses, one around the attacker and one around the victim. It's based on the loudness of the attack. So... That's why stealth attacks were better because they were labeled as quiet. The um, Every attack was labeled quiet, normal, and loud. And quiet had a very small radius, normal had a regular radius, and loud had a really big radius. So when you attack someone, it would do radii around both the attacker and the victim saying, hey, uh, it would send out an event. Either I'm attacking victim from the attacker or I'm being attacked by by attacker, by the victim. Actually, I believe it only reported who the attacker was if the victim could see the attacker. Otherwise, it just said, I was attacked from, a, and it gave a location, but no object. That was why if you shot someone from really far away, things would run in your direction, but until they could see you, they didn't know it was you. The cool thing about having those two was when at the attacker sent out, hey, I'm attacking this, that's what tells your followers or anybody who's on, if it's an NPC, anybody on their faction, I'm attacking this guy, do you want to help me? For the victim, it was like, I'm being attacked. Does anybody want to help me? People like guards would always help victims. Otherwise, they'd look for people on your faction and those who would help and who wouldn't. When we first made this, we had the funniest bug where... I forgot that traps were implemented as just doing an attack on whoever triggered the trap. So the first time this happened, the trap went off. And I think it was a companion. They got attacked by like an arrow trap. And then they went over and they started punching the arrow trap because they were angry at it for attacking them. And it was attackable. It had health. It could be destroyed. Took that out and said, hey, people realize that inanimate objects don't have intention. And also, by the way, this um, this announcement thing was the same thing was done whenever you tampered. And tampered was picking a lock, picking a pocket or whatever. That was tampering in the AI system. And tampering was also done with a report nearby. Mo usually tampering, I think, was marked as being quiet. And that way, if anybody nearby cared about you doing it, if they were on the faction of the person being pickpocketed or I believe the lock had an owner... And they were on the faction. And keep in mind, guards helped every faction. Then they would go in and see what was going on with the tampering. And then one other interesting thing about our AI was bodies. If you killed someone, 
the body remembered who killed them. They stored it away. Remember that in Fallout, we let you drag bodies. So you could get near a body and click something it would drag to you and you could click and drag it. So you could get it away from, if there was like a guard walking around or during the day there was a street, people walked up and down, you could get it off that area. And here's why. Whenever an NPC saw a dead body, they would look to see if they cared. And they cared if, again, they were on the same faction as the dead body. So friends, uh, other shopkeepers or whatever. Or, like I said, guards always care. So they would look. And if they were if they cared about that body being dead, then they would look to see who killed them. And they would start looking for them. Now, the killer... The, the, it was called the combat focus. It was wiped after a period of time. I believe it was about 15 game minutes. Unless the player was still nearby. So it was only wiped. It was only checked if the player, if the, if, if the player l- walked away and it had been a certain amount of time, it was wiped. If the player stared, stayed nearby, it stayed on the, on the dead body. So if a guard saw it, it went, oh, so-and-so was the killer. And they start walking around looking for the killer. The way we made sure if the player wanted to hang out in one area, corpses would decay in 24 hours automatically. They would turn into a blood splatter. Or if there was already a blood splatter there, the corpse would just be deleted. The blood splatter would go away in two days. So no matter what, in two days, all evidence of the crime would be gone. But that is one of the reasons we put it in there is we wanted to let people be able to take out an NPC, take out a guard, whatever, and then drag the body to an out-of-the-way place so no one would see it. I thought that was pretty cool. I'm not sure how often people used it. I'd love to hear if you ever made use of that. I think we had a lot of people in QA that I would constantly remind them they could do that, and they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, It was part of the testing plan, but I've already gone in about how testing plans back in the 90s and early 2000s were seen as a set of fun suggestions but not always followed. Anyway, that's pretty much a big high-level view of how AI worked in Arcanum. The the heartbeat drove what the player normally, what the NPC did, walked around, ran their shop, whatever they were supposed to be doing, by the, usually by their social class. And then combat was driven by either turn-based or real-time. And the NPC moved through those different states. So I hope that gave you some idea of how we did AI. And despite what the YouTube algorithm thinks, I hope people liked it.